Evening, this is Pastor Sean again at the First Baptist Church of Oneida, uh, sharing some time with you in our Wednesday night Bible study. We want to encourage you to continue to remember those on your prayer list, and we want to start this evening with a word of prayer, but I want uh, to remind you all to continue to remember uh, John Charles Lay as they uh, are at Vanderbilt, and he's seeking medical attention there. And remember others who are battling COVID and those who are sick. We pray for them, that God would touch them and be with them and encourage them uh, as they go through this. Uh, pray for Linda, his wife as well. Uh, but uh, we just pray that God would move in a mighty way. And we enjoy this time that we get to spend with you tonight. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start our study. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and for your many blessings. And Lord, we pause this evening to... Think about uh, what all you've done for us and what all we've been through, Lord. And we continue to look to you each and every day for our sustenance, Lord. And we thank you for being a, a creator, uh, our redeemer, our sustainer, Lord. And, and throughout all that goes on in this life, uh, that you have given us the promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So, Lord, I pray that you would continue uh, to encourage us and remind us who you are uh, in lieu of what's going on around us. Now tonight as we look at uh, Genesis, Lord, I pray that we go back to the garden and we think about what transpired, but we also, Lord, don't just stay there, but we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament and we understand uh, that the freedoms that we have in this world, especially freedom from sin, Lord, is only because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. So help us to appreciate our religious freedom and treasure it, Lord, and we thank you for all that you bless us with in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on Wednesday nights, if you've been joining us, I have been reading a little bit from a document and then uh, piggybacking off of that by going to Scripture. But this is called the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. This is a creed. This is a solid theological statement, uh, I believe, that gives us some guidance when it comes to our Baptist faith. Now, let me remind you uh, that Baptists are very diverse and not all Baptists agree on everything, but uh, maybe when you're looking for a pastor or a pastor search committee uh, is uh, formed and they're looking for a pastor, they would ask the candidate, do you hold to the Baptist Faith and Message 2000? And that's just uh, common ground and a great, I think, uh, a sufficient doctrinal uh, statement, if you will, or creed, if you will, to give you an idea about what we believe in the Baptist faith. But let me remind you, like I said just a few seconds ago, Baptists are a very diverse bunch, so um, there are some doctrines that they will uh, not entirely agree on, and um, we pray that we will celebrate what we have in common way more than some of those small differences. And in looking at those differences, we do what's called theological triage, and we ask ourselves, is this of a first-order importance, second-order importance, or third-order, all right? And we need not argue over things like third-order issues. And I will give you an example. I've told you this in the past, eschatology, the, the, uh, th the study of end times. Now, some people will go to war over your end time belief and if you don't believe like them they feel like they can have no fellowship with you but I do not believe that I just don't think that eschatology ought to be something that you fight uh, tooth and nail over all right so what what I fight over obviously the virgin birth that salvation is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone we call those cardinal doctrines. And so there are cardinal doctrines. You are saved by grace through faith that we stand upon. Jesus is God. Jesus was sinless. Certain things like that. But today we find ourselves in this article called Religious Liberty. And oh, we could go a lot of different directions. But I'm just going to barely skim the surface. And I'm going to say that I am so glad that we are not persecuted for our faith. I am so glad the Constitution of the United States reads as it does. And men before us, we stand on their shoulders, um, I pray, uh, savoring and enjoying uh, the freedoms that we have in this world. Now, the Baptist Faith and Message says this about religious liberty. God alone is Lord of the conscience, and He has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men 
which are contrary to his word or not contained in it. Church and state should be separate. The state owes to every church protection and full freedom in the pursuit of its spiritual ends. In providing for such freedom, no ecclesiastical group or denomination should be favored by the state more than others. Civil government being ordained of God, it is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience therein to all things not contrary to the revealed will of God. The church should not resort to the, to the civil power to carry on its work. The gospel of Christ contemplates spiritual means alone for the pursuit of its ends. The state has no right to impose penalties for religious opinions of any kind. The state has no right to impose taxes for the support of any form of religion. A free church and a free state is the Christian ideal, and this implies the right of free and unhindered access to God on the part of all men and the right to form and propagate opinions in the sphere of religion without interference by the civil power. Now, as you consider what's going on in this day and age and the, the climate, you, uh, you might realize that religious liberty is uh, under attack, all right? And I think about uh, men who I really look up to, uh, I would say like a John MacArthur out there in California who will not, uh, you know, have his church cease from uh, meeting, and, and there's many, many others, and we admire them for their stick to -itiveness. We admire them and, and for taking a bold stand. And I think, you know, this is what we need to do more as churches is we need to take a stand when it comes to our religious freedom, all right? We don't want to be, um, and i and I, I got to be careful when I talk about this because I want you to understand my heart, all right, especially in the middle of this pandemic. We don't talk about this a lot uh, because in the preaching hour on Sunday morning, I want to lift up the name of Jesus. But when it comes to Bible study on a Wednesday night, I don't mind to, to sail into these uh, waters that are dangerous and, you know, fraught with icebergs everywhere, you might say, because uh, the, the, the rationale that I've tried to exercise in this pandemic as a leader is I don't want to endanger anyone um, as far as staying open and then a lot of people getting sick because I know how the society at large will point to churches and point the finger, and they have done that. Uh, religious gatherings have, have been, uh, you know, mentioned as, oh, that's one of the big places where people are getting sick. So my rationale in all this has been uh, you want to honor government and you want to do what our governor says, but then at the end of the day, you also want to obey God. Now, this reminds me of the apostles in Acts chapter 4, and they are told to be quiet, to hush up, and to not mention the name of Jesus. And you know what Peter and John say. And, and I mean, I can flip over there uh, real quickly and, and remind us. But they basically say to the religious leaders and, and the elite of that day, whether it is right in your eyes or not, we must obey God. And that is exactly uh, where I land when it comes to um, religious freedom. We must obey God rather than men. Now, we want to be law-abiding citizens, but in the Baptist Faith and Message, it also talks about following the government and unless it goes against God's revealed will, all right? And so we try to balance those and say we want to be common sense, we want to be law-abiding citizens, but what happens when the state reaches over into the church, all right, then, Houston, we have a problem. And so I just want to remind us tonight that we need to be uh, peacekeepers. And I am all about trying to keep the peace. But church, I want you to understand there's, when, there's a time and place when you stop keeping the peace and you stand on your convictions. And that's what churches need to do in this day and age is keep the peace all the while, not teetering back and forth, not... Uh, diluting the message, uh, being very conscious of erosion in Christianity and saying, you know what, we are going to stand on the word of God and we're going to believe that God is going to take care of us. So along with the message that I preached last Sunday from First, uh, First Timothy chapter 2, I reminded us that we do need to pray for our president, pray for all leaders, those in authority. 
And, and that's how we, we continue to progress the gospel, I believe, is that we pray that God would give us wisdom and show us all throughout. Now, I want to go back to Genesis chapter 1 and just kind of give us some basic theological principles to remind us of who we are and, and why we were created. Now, Genesis 1, 27 is, is very specific. Now, let me pick up with verse uh, 26 of Genesis chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to be in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 this evening. But I want to remind us when it comes to uh, religious freedom, when it comes to how we were created, why we were created, this tells us specifically that we were created in God's image. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, this is Trinitarian language. Who do you think our is? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over all creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, I'm going to just deviate from what I want to talk about this evening for a moment and, and really try to, in a polite way, address the, chan the transgender problem. I see that uh, our president is going to uh, allow or moving to allow transgenders to serve into the military. Now, I want to tell you something. I was in the Navy in 1994 to 1998 and in the reserves after that. I was on a ship all those years. And there were no women on the USS America. There were no women on the USS Scott, which was a guided missile destroyer out of Mayport, Florida. USS America was out of Norfolk. I cannot begin to tell you the problems that I see with that uh, coming into our military. Now, I want you to understand something right here, right now. Because I'm a Christian, because I stand on the Word of God, I believe what, Bi the, what the Bible says, that mankind was created in God's own image, and the Bible says male and female. That's it, all right? That is it. There's no... Uh, in between, there's no transgenderness that the Bible recognizes. You are either a male or you are a female. And it really um, upsets dads, I think, and moms as well, but to think about people who would try to abuse the fact of their identity to go into a restroom where, uh, say, my daughter goes in and you want to identify as a, as a female and you're really a male in order so that you can, uh, you know, lust or, 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 or try to get a peep on something. That my, that, my friends, is just sick, all right? That is sick. And we live in a, a very sin-plagued world, and I believe that people need to start standing up for our convictions, and it just shows you how our leadership is, is, uh, it, it does not align with the Word of God. All right. If we are not pilgrims in an unholy land, I don't know what we are. All right. So this whole battle about transgenderness blows my mind, boils my blood, and I try to remain calm as a preacher. But it, the Bible is my basic set of beliefs, and I want you to understand this is God's word here, and God says He created male and female. You're either one or you're the other. All right. And so. Uh, I just pray for that situation. I, I pray that, uh, you know, we understand something that, uh, you know, I want you to understand my heart, uh, along with sex, uh, homosexuality being a sin and being wrong. I will tell you tonight that I would welcome someone who was a homosexual to our church, and they would be more than welcome to come and sit and listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would be uh, allowed to participate in activities. They would not allow, they would not be allowed to become a church member, all right, because a, an under shepherd has to protect the flock. So you're not going to become a church member and you're not going to be a leader in our church uh, when you project that lifestyle. However, I'm not going to hate you, I'm not going to ostracize you, all right? We're all made in God's image. And, and so what I want us to understand is this isn't hate speech. 
I don't hate anybody. Now, I don't like the idea, like I said, of somebody trying to play a transgender card so that they could lust after the flesh. Now, no, I don't like that at all. But God loves everybody, and I believe that. And the gospel is for everybody. I believe that. But I do believe sin has tainted this world, and I believe people try to take advantage of that. And for that, I'm not going to stand for. I'm not going to just sit back with a deaf ear and a blind eye and watch sin run rampant all around me, parading itself. No, that's not what an under-shepherd does, all right? So I want you to understand my heart because I believe the gospel is for everybody. I believe God does love everybody, and I believe everybody ought to be welcome uh, in church. I don't think we need to rail against homosexuals. I don't think we need to rail against transgenderness. I'm not saying that we need to beat up on those folk or any other folk for that matter. I believe the gospel is for everybody. But I want you to know something. I can disagree with something and you can disagree with something. And I pray, you know, I pray that there's a level of cordialness that we can conduct there. But I'm going to tell you on certain things like that, we've got to take a stand on what the Bible says. It's not what the pastor says, all right, as far as that goes, or believes, but it's what the Word of God says. And if we are Christians and we believe this Word, then we're going to stand on the Word, all right? Let me move on because I don't want to wax too eloquent on those discussions. But I just know some things that are going on in the world today that are troubling, all right? So as the Bible tells us, before the fall, and I want you to remember this, as God creates light in the day and the night and animals and humans themselves, the Bible says it was good, okay? It was good. But then as we progress and we remember what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden, we understand that God has given man free will. Now, I'm not going to get into the argument tonight about divine sovereignty and free will and try to pit them against each other because as the great theologian and pastor Charles Spurgeon said, why try to reconcile friends? There is divine sovereignty taught in the scriptures and there is also the free will of man taught in the scriptures. Now, how you articulate that and flesh that out, that's a different story. That's for another time and place. But what I do want to tell you is we have religious freedom in Christ Jesus, all right? We have a, a free thinking, if you will, or free will. And in Adam and Eve, they made a choice to partake of that tree. And when they did, you know what the Bible says. I'm going to pick up in the temptation in the fall in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, church family, we've got to stop right there because I want you to understand this is one of Satan's tactics or Satan's lies or his deceptions, you might say. Satan wants to cast doubt on the Word of God. All right? Now, he, he definitely is saying this to... Um, to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Eve said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. He mixes no words. God does not mix any words. Eve understands that. She knows that. Now, watch how Satan twists and turns and deceives. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, Satan is saying, God doesn't have your best interest in mind, because he knows that once you partake of this, you taste of this, then you will, uh, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God. And you know that Satan's biggest downfall was he wanted to be God, all right? He had a terrible, terrible pride issue. And as you think about this tonight, he's telling her, God, he, he, you'll be like him. You'll know good and evil. So evidently, this hit Eve in such a way that she was so tempted that when she saw the tree that was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then, now listen, 
Adam is with her all this time, all right? So Adam, you know, he play, tries to play the blame game later on, but he was right there with Eve, and he knows he wasn't supposed to partake. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the both of their eyes were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Hmm. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman you have given to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Here we go. Adam's trying to play the blame game. Adam was with Eve the whole time, and he knew better. But now he turns to blame her. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman, she blames it on the snake or the serpent. The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And now here what we have is called the Proto-Evangelium, all right? So if you have, are wondering, is Christ in the Old Testament? He absolutely is in the Old Testament from Genesis to Revelation. The blood-stained pages of Scripture speak out a message that says, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And here the Bible tells us, because Eve have done this, judgment's coming. You are cursed more than all cattle. Now, this is what is said to the serpent. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, I want you to see something here in verses... Uh, four, beginning of verse 14. What we have in verse 14 is judgment because the Bible says about the serpent, you are cursed more than all the cattle. But then if you look down in verse 15, grace intervenes with this statement, between you and the woman, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And in your Bible, uh, most Bibles capitalize seed, meaning Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what the Bible is talking about because the Bible says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we understand that this is, a, this is the, the first sign of good news because of the fall. Now let me remind you, if you're looking at scripture in like if it was a play, if you will, like Acts, Acts 1, uh, not the book of Acts, but Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4, Act 1 is creation. Act 2 is fall. Act 3, we call that redemption. Act 4 is consummation. We live between redemption and consummation. Jesus hasn't come back yet. One day he is. But we see four great acts of Scripture. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. And here right in Genesis we have creation and fall just like that. And now since the fall has happened... Everything has changed. Now, I want to remind you about how sin works, all right? Many times in our life, we fall into sinful patterns because we see, we lust, we take, we partake, all right? This is like a pattern here. We see something we want, we go and partake of it, we lust after it, and we, we take it. We eat it, we drink it, uh, whatever it might be. We partake of the sin that we know that we should not partake of. And it starts really with our eyes and our mind. We think about it and we see it and then we want it. And this is exactly how Eve was deceived. So Genesis 1, 26 and 27 were made in God's image. God's original design was that Adam and Eve would walk through, that, through the garden and tend it and they would never know that they were naked. But right here in Genesis 3, sin comes into the world. So God's design was good but then sin comes into the world, and now what we see is brokenness. 
Now I'm going to lead you through the three circles, guys, because this is an evangelism tool that I have showed you before. But I'm just going to remind you that God's design in the beginning was good. Sin entered into the world, and now there's brokenness. Everywhere we look, there's brokenness. People are trying to satisfy the lust of the flesh with drugs, with alcohol, with sex, with entertainment, with power, with money. There's so many avenues that people try to fix their brokenness with. And if I could tell you something this evening, if you have a God-sized hole in your heart, how is it do you think that that hole is going to be filled with anything other than God? You see, all these things of this world are temporary. They're fleeting. They're passing. And the things that you keep holding on to are going to keep letting go of you because nothing or no one can replace God. So brokenness is everywhere. Well, you say, preacher, how, what, what, what needs to happen? Well, the gospel is what needs to be heard in your life. And you and I need to repent and believe. The Bible tells us that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we have God's design is good, but sin is in the world. The second circle is brokenness. Brokenness is everywhere. How can we get back to God's original design or to where one day we will all be living in heaven with him? The gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about the good news that Jesus saves. So we repent and we believe. John three sixteen. For God so loveth the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Romans ten thirteen. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 5. I could name verse after verse. But we need to understand that God's original design. Everything was good. Everything was right. But when sin entered into the world, things changed. Thank God we still have religious freedom in this world. But I want you to understand that it's under attack. I want you to understand that we live in a post, 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 post Christian world. And I believe in the upcoming days, listen to me closely tonight, that the message of Christianity is going to become more and more abrasive to the world that we live in. Now, you know, the Lord could be doing some pruning and some weeding out because tonight you either believe in Jesus Christ or you don't believe. Some of us tonight um, might uh, think that we believe, but when persecution comes, you know, we might be one of those that runs. I pray that we don't. And this is re and, and let me just bring this back to... Uh, to, to kind of what my end times belief is. And you don't have to agree with me, and we can agree to disagree. I grew up being what's called a dispensational premillennialist all my life. Some of y'all know that term. Some of you are like, preacher, don't use them $5 words. But as I studied scripture and I looked at historical premillennialism, you know, many people love to lean on the fact that the church is not going to be present during the tribulation because we're going to be raptured out. Um, I would like to think that, but I don't know that for sure. And, and there are other preachers that believe that the church will be present during the tribulation. And, and that's called that purging or that weeding out process. Now, I'm going to pray for a pre-trib rapture, all right? You know, I pray. I pray that, that God raptures us out of here before that time of intense persecution, before that time of tribulation. But what if God doesn't take the church out before the tribulation? And that's a time of cleansing and purging. I'm just giving you a what if. And it just seems to me like in this day and age that we live in. Now we live in eastern Tennessee, right? We live in the Bible Belt. You know, there's not a lot of persecution here, but make no mistake about it. There's a lot of persecution in this world, in the United States. And there's a lot of people who are antagonistic to the gospel message. And we have got to stand on the Word of God. What would I encourage you and challenge you to do tonight? Stand on the Word of God. Don't water it down. Appreciate, grasp, hold on to your religious freedom. All the while, seeking to keep peace, see, seeking to live peacefully and honorably and quietly among men, as 1 Timothy 2 talks about, so that we can live quiet lives and peaceful lives. But at the same time, we can only be pushed so far. 
You have to obey God rather than man, I believe. Now, church, it might come a time here soon where we're going to be hard-pressed, where we might live in a place like Paul lived when Nero was the emperor. I thank God for, like I said, the Constitution and men who built the, uh, who, who, who formed and shaped the United States of America. Uh, thank you. Thank them and be appreciative for our history and our heritage. But make no mistake about it. There are some who are out there to change history. And it ought not to sit very well with us one iota. So I pray that we would embrace God's word, stand on that word, and be uh, like a, just a, like a fort, like a strong wall when it comes to sharing our faith and being the Christian that God has called us to be. We are not promised tomorrow, so I pray that we live each day to the glory of the Lord. Enjoy your religious freedom. Stand on the word of God. Be firm, be fair, love everyone. No hate speech here. No, no uh, isolating anybody saying that they can't come to our church and listen to the gospel. I'm not for that one bit. Now, I might disagree with somebody's lifestyle, but that doesn't mean that I can't treat them with Christian love and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. All right? So I pray for us as a church that God would give us wisdom and direction. And all you all out there listening in whatever church you attend, God would bless your churches with wisdom, how to navigate these days, standing on our religious freedom, standing on the word of God, understanding that God has given us a commission and that we would be the church that God has called us to be. All right? I want to pray for us right now. And let's pray that God would use us amidst all of what's going on. Dear Lord, I thank you for our time together and thank you for, a, you know, another look at Genesis and reminding us, Lord, that when sin entered into the world, it changed everything. But Lord, we are indeed free if we are in Christ Jesus. Thank you that I can sing that song. Thank God I am free from this world of sin, washed in the blood of Jesus and born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved. I'm saved by his amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Now, please help us, Lord, as we seek to try to be bridgers, unifiers, and keep the unity of the Spirit at the First Baptist Church of Oneida. Lord, I pray that you would give us everything we need each day and that we would listen to you, uh, we would be still and know that you were in total control. Lord, help people to understand that, that, I, that as an under-shepherd of this church, I'm not going to preach hateful messages. I don't want to hate anybody. But I am going to stand on the word. Because if I don't stand on the word, then I need to give up my position as pastor. The word is my power. The word is my plan. The word is everything to me. So God, I pray that each time I stand behind this desk, I rightly divide the word of truth, that I speak the truth in love, and that I help people see Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for watching over us. God, be with us in these upcoming days and help us to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that God blesses you with a great week. This is Wednesday, hump day. Have a great Thursday and Friday. And if you can go to your local house of worship, get there on Sunday and lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God bless you.